All right, I trust I'm audible. There's no feedback squeal unless I show this in front of the speaker. So if you all get out of hand, that's what's going to that'll be your punishment. Do upper conditioning. I'm Bob Lewis, and you're not. Actually, you might be. If you Google Bob Lewis, it's terrifying, actually, how many of me there are and how much we've accomplished in our life. We're going to be talking about, well, never mind that. Before we talk about what we're going to talk about, I need an agreement with all of you. This is one of three tracks. There's another track right through that wall. We want them all to know they're in the wrong track. So here's what we're going to do. Every time I say Python, I used to do Linux, but Linux is a little now. Every time I say Python, I want you to all act like you heard the funniest joke you've ever heard in your life. <laughs> Laugh as loud as you can, whoop a little bit. Can we do this? Let's give it a try. Okay, ready? Python. <laughs> oh, I like this group. <laughs> We're gonna get along just fine. <laughs> okay. Okay, so here's the deal. How many of you in this room consider yourselves to be millennials? What's the problem? Darn. A few more? Okay, here's the deal. Millennials are the sixth consecutive worst generation uh, ever. Right? Yes! Okay. Number six. <laughs> Number six. Well, listen, in the 1950s, first we had the greatest generation. That wasn't fair because they were, they were great. After that, we had the 50s and we had beatniks, and then we had the 60s and we had hippies, and then we had the 70s and we had disco. So, if, you millennials are too young to remember disco and just how horrible it was. So, anyway, millennials, self-absorbed, have no work ethic. You're entitled, and your cell phones are glued to your hands. And so, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and forget all that. That's, that's utter nonsense. And by the way, that no work ethic thing, I came of age in the '60s. If you ever, if you're in, a, if you're a millennial and you run across somebody my age, a little older, telling you that your generation has no work ethic, ask them about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Ask them about tune in, turn on, drop out. Ask them about if you're part of the system, you're part of the problem. And oh, by the way. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak got their start selling technology to steal free long distance from corporations. So work ethic is something that my generation discovered pretty late in life. So anyway, so forget about that. But a generation called millennials have a few, have two characteristics that are truly unique. And here's what they are and they matter. First one is, this is a generation, it's the first generation that came of age in a society where there was no expectation of cradle-to-grave employment. Your grandparents, after World War II, came home from the war. When they got a job, they expected to be employed by the same company until the day they retired. Most of them were, unless they had a good opportunity someplace. But most of them were employed by one company, cradle-to-grave. You got after 25 years or 50 years, you got a gold watch. I mean, it was a tradition. That fell apart when Toyota started selling cars in the United States in the 70s. I, now I know this is history, and but don't worry, it gets worse. So this is the most entertaining part of this. Uh, no, actually, I hope it gets better. Sit down. <laughs> Parents, Toyota, and Toyota. <laughs> I didn't say I was nice, I said I'm from out of town and I don't care. <laughs> Toyota invaded, invaded the United States in the 1970s. The Japanese started selling products and American companies were in full retreat. There was a joke going on because they were using the money to buy so much property. The joke was, we have a new plot to get even with the Japanese, we're going to bomb Pearl Harbor. That was funny then. <laughs> well, actually it wasn't, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah, listen, we'll, we'll get to something with substance one of these hours. Uh, with the invasion of the United States by the Japanese manufacturing companies, we suddenly had massive layoffs of American employees from companies that couldn't afford to keep them. And along with the layoffs themselves came a change in employment philosophy. Instead of cradle to grave employment, and that being the expectation, unless things were truly dire, I have, I've heard CEOs use this phrase, 
uh, employees need to understand, he said, that they are fu now fungible commodities. Anybody know what the word fungible means? Come on, somebody here has to be literate. What's fungible mean? You're not it. You, now you're screwed. <laughs> Transformable into one way from another. Transformable one way or another? Yeah. Other definition? Mutable. You're close. Mutable. Not, now, beautiful is not it. Mutable. Mutable. Oh, mutable. mutable. Yep, interchangeable. Disposable. Another word that rhymes with fungible? Hmm? Another word that rhymes with fungible? Uh, yeah, fungible. Let's, not go, <laughs> let's not go there. So, but they had the expectation of cradle to grave employment because that's what their parents had. Millennials are the first generation to grow up with no expectation at all of any form of employer loyalty. It's no longer in the landscape. Employment is called at-will employment. At-will employment means we don't have to reason to get rid of your sorry behind. All we have to do is not be in the mood to have you as an employee anymore. The lawyers have dressed that phrasing up a little bit, but that's what it means. This is the first generation to grow up with no expectation of any kind that they will have a job tomorrow just because they had a job yesterday and did it well. There's another characteristic that this generation has that no other, that really is true of anybody before, and that is, this is the first generation to grow up s surrounded by technology. IT departments, uh, how many of you work in a formal IT department someplace, largest corporation, okay. When I entered the workforce and I actually had some hair and all you know, the things that go with it, and I worked the help desk for a while, and one of the things that they do on the help desk is they tell end user jokes, or dumb user jokes, like, you, you all know these, white out on the screen, har, 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 right? Couldn't get the PC to work, what do you do? You reverse the plug, you know, change the polarity, only it's a three-prong plug. So we had lots of jokes like that. Well, while we're telling these jokes, millennials have grown up with microprocessor-powered toys. And the next toy had a different user interface. Using, learning a different user interface is about as challenging as it is for me when I get a new rental car and I gotta figure out where the windshield wiper is. This is a generation that's grown up where technology isn't just present, it's pervasive. It's all around, and you just expect it to be wherever it makes sense and it works. So this is not the millennial generation. This is a generation where technology is embedded in their lives. So from here on in, I want you to call millennials the embedded technology generation, or EPG, because that's what they are. Python. <laughs> I know, but see, you guys meant that. <laughs> That's good. All right. So, this really is a speech about the embedded technology generation, but what I'm going to be talking about this happening in the world of business and the world of work probably wouldn't be the case if the emerging workforce weren't the embedded technology generation. Oh, well, come on in. It's better here. <laughs> I'd say Python again, but mm -hmm. too hot. Anyway. Okay, so what's changing? Because the world of work is changing, the world of business is changing, and if it isn't, I'm going to give you a plug because I've got a book coming out, and what I'm about to say is taken from the book, and if it all turns out to be wrong with any luck, you'll forget I ever said this, but whatever it turns out to be right, then you'll say, hey, I heard this guy talk, and he got this absolute, it's just amazing. So here's one of the things. You have all heard over and over and over again that the world of business is, ex is accelerating, the change is happening faster and faster. This is not new, right? At least I hope it's not new. Here's what hasn't been explored to the extent it should be explored. Here's what comes with that. There's a ratio. And the ratio is how long it takes things to, to or how, sorry, let me, I don't damn ratio and I get it backwards. How long things stay the same and how long it takes them to change. And the deal is, things don't stay the same as long as they used to. So a corporation used to bring in a new information processing system of some kind, and it could take them five years to build the system and train people and bring the uh, company up to speed, bring a train employees of what to do. 
And that was okay because they would expect that system that took five years to build, they expected the last 20 years. And they usually did, which is why a few of you are old enough to remember the Y2K crisis. Anybody remember Y2K? Okay. How many of you got to party like it was 1999 and how many of you had to stay in the data center just in case things went wrong? Right? For all the thanks you got. It was thanks a lot. It was all a fraud. It was just IT trying to suck money out of the corporate coffers. And people believe that nonsense, which has nothing to do with the talk, by the way. I just had to say it. So, you don't get 20 years for a system anymore. Mostly, you don't get 10 years. Five years, we have the internet now, in case you hadn't heard. Come on, guys, Python. <laughs> I have to cue you guys when it's time for the laugh track. What the hell is this? Okay. So here's the thing. You're working in marketing time now. Systems don't get a chance to last very long. But it takes almost as long now to change things as it ever did. But the payoff has to happen over a much shorter period of time. So that stay the same to change ratio is getting worse every year that goes by. Now, here's the money thing. Because I know what radio station all of you listen to in the morning every day when you go to work. It's W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me? So here's what's in it for you. The stay the same to change ratio is getting shorter and shorter. Or smaller and smaller. What this means is that the marketplace for really good project managers is going to do nothing but expand because project manager is the profession that makes change happen in a corporation. So if you take nothing else away from this brilliant talk that you're attending right now, this guys, here's what I want you to reach over to the person next to you, put your fingers right here. <laughs> okay. Project manager is that is the profession that makes change happen in corporations and there will be nothing but an increasing demand as time goes on because there's a the need for more and more change and the changes don't last as long. Now here's something else. Remember that no more cradle to grave employment and at will employment and all of that? Well here's the funny thing. Well it's not really all that funny but here's the odd thing. <laughs> you can always just say Python. I've been giving this piece before. I've just figured it as I go along. Give me a break. This guy's looking at me at the back of the room. He's going, what the hell? <laughs> okay. For employers, employees are a pain in the keister. It's a fact. There's nothing about having employees that's easy. It's work. You have to have an entire HR department just to avoid getting sued. And you probably get sued anyway. Employers are generally happier with contractors. The only thing that keeps them from having nothing but contractors is that the IRS has rules that say if this worker has this fits a set of characteristics, then whether you like it or not, you must call them an employee and treat them that way. So, but all things considered, oh, and by the way, there are those benefits things that really cost a lot of money. Employers would rather have contractors any day of the week because it's easier. You can bring them in when you need them, and you can get rid of them when you don't need that particular skill anymore. You can bring in other people with different skills. You don't have to pay benefits. You don't need an HR department to worry about them. But here is what's very strange, is that people who a decade ago, two decades ago, would have wanted to be employees, have found they are much happier being freelancers, much happier contracting, being mercenaries, going into a company, doing some work, getting paid for the work, probably better than they would have been paid as employees. When that project's done, they find someplace else to work and it's great. So much to employer surprise, an increasing fraction of the workforce also likes things this way. And I promise you I'm not going to get into any form of politics here, but those of you who yourselves would prefer to be contractors and like that lifestyle, be very happy there's something called the Affordable Care Act. It may not be a perfect piece of legislation, but there are a, there's a large fraction of the workforce that are only employees instead of contractors to
to get health insurance. So this is good for everybody from that perspective at least. I'll leave the politics out of it. One more thing, by the way, if you are an employee, it's a piece of advice, put 25% of your after-tax earnings in a bank account, CD, or very safe mutual fund because chances are pretty good for no reason that you have any control over, you'll find yourself unemployed about one year out of every four. If you have the financial wherewithal to survive that without a source of income for a while, you can get the next job you want instead of the job that you must get tomorrow or you're going to lose your house. So, employment is actually the least secure form of paycheck because you have less control. Oh, and one more thing. They do that once more. I get a call the same of a certain snake. Um, as a contractor, you have far more control, and because the relationship is always fresh, you're ready to leave before they're ready for you to leave. So for whatever that's worth. Next topic, permeability. Corporations are under this strange notion that they can protect their valuable intellectual property. They are, by the way, under the strange notion that their intellectual property, in fact, is very valuable. <laughs> now, there is some that you really do want to protect. Like, for example, you have these lists of human beings called customers, and you might have collected their social security number for some reason that I can't really begin to fathom most of the time. And these little things called credit card numbers that lots of people want. So you want to protect that really well. But then you have things like PowerPoint presentations, internal white papers, um, stuff like that that really nobody cares about. And companies pay just as much attention to protecting this stuff. Fact of the matter is, first, most of it isn't very interesting. Second, most of it isn't worth protecting. And third, if you stop trying to protect it altogether and instead realize that your business is part of a larger community, it's part of a whole business ecosystem, if you take care of the ecosystem properly, it will pay you back in spades, far better off. Now, before I delve into this further, uh, a little, a few factoids, because, I mean, companies patent the damnedest things. So, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office receives about 40,000 new applications a year for software patents. Python. Because, <laughs> this is, actually isn't funny. This is a tragedy. Let me ask anybody in this room, does anybody in this room seriously think, remember, a, a software a, or a patent of any kind is supposed to be non-obvious, interesting, and valuable. Right? Does anybody in this room seriously think there are 40,000 new things to do with software in a year that are fundamentally non-obvious? You guys create this software, right? Okay, how many of you have come up with this brand new idea nobody else would have thought to do with software before? I've seen patents. Uh, There's a company a number of years ago when the World Wide Web was fresh and young and their employees filed expense reports. They figured out that they could file the same expense reports over the internet. They got a patent for that. I mean, this is just plain pathetic. So this is the kind of thing companies are trying to protect. Now, if instead they thought the other way around, they would understand that there is this huge source of free expertise out there that all of you get from all of you that they get for free. For example, I presume most of you spend some time on GitHub. Okay, GitHub is not a new concept for you. I have, now understand, I'm, I'm geezing. I'm, I'm 63. My teeth are still mostly here, but it's only a matter of time before I'm not. It's long past time that I say, when I was your age, which is a sure sign that I've got nothing useful to say to any of you. I talk to colleagues my age about GitHub, and they either say, what's that, or what are you, nuts? Okay, remember that stay the same to change ratio? Okay, 
how much faster can you develop software if you can take advantage of everything that's out there on GitHub to get you a start for a new project? Pretty impressive, right? Companies that take advantage of that faster than their competitors? Okay. This is a case of using what's out there and giving back to what's out there and the entire ecosystem is enriched compared to if you try and lock it all down. If your employees are able to say, I'm working on a project, this is on LinkedIn discussion group or something along those lines, do you have any ideas you could help me? Being part of an online community makes things better and make things faster because you have access to a much broader variety of ideas. The fact of the matter is, like it or not, CEOs may not like it, but it is a fact. Companies are permeable. And, oh, one more thing. Remember those employees who are now at-will employees and increasing use of contractors because they're more convenient? Every time they leave the door, what's in their heads? Everything they learned about the company that they're leaving. So here's what's happened. Companies are trying to save the day by having you sign employment contracts or non-compete contracts. And what they say is, I'm not making this up. If you work behind the counter at a Jimmy John's making sandwiches, you may not work for another fast food company making sandwiches for a year and a half. I, don't, I shouldn't have to say Python for this one, guys. But is that sad or what? Oh. <laughs> okay. The world is permeable. Jimmy John's cannot protect their unique method of putting mayonnaise, meat, lettuce, and tomato on a piece of bread. But they're trying because they know the world is permeable and for some unearthly reason I can't begin to fathom, they think that depriving somebody of the ability to make a living with a competitor is worth being so stupid. Because really, what does this do to the Jimmy John's brand? They're idiots, right? <laughs> Pardon me. I'm so, there's a report in the room, they're alleged idiots. <laughs> okay. So, all of you in the modern workforce, whether you're in or as contractors or whether you are in as employees, the fact of the matter is the world is permeable. As individuals, you can take advantage of that permeability to impress the daylights out of managers who don't know that you're getting all that code off of GitHub, you didn't write it yourself. If you're a manager in a company, you can get some leverage over your fellow managers because your project teams will do things twice as fast because they're getting code off of GitHub instead and all of those good ideas. So, for whatever that's worth. Okay, we got one more topic. No, I expect Python? you guys to like, <laughs> do I even need to? <laughs> what a relief that is. Okay. Oh yeah, one more time. Okay, I'm gonna introduce you to a new metric, but before I do, I presume most of you have seen or heard of the Terminator movies, right? <laughs> so Skynet becomes intelligent all by itself, and how many other movies and stuff have, have it been where just because there are a lot more computers connected, suddenly intelligence bursts forth all on its own. Isn't this terrifying? Okay, well, let me just tell you, and I speak as a former evolutionary biologist, I'm not making this up. Sometime in the break, I'll tell you about electric fish. Um, I'm not making that up either. Human, every form of behavior that any animal has ever exhibited has evolved multiple times, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of times over the course of evolution. Whether it's territoriality or pecking orders or the use of tools or any number of things, pick out a behavior, pick out a social system, it's evolved multiple times in multiple, multiple lineages over the last billion and a half years or so. Except for human style intelligence, which has evolved exactly once. The odds of human style intelligence evolving is incredibly low. Otherwise, it would have evolved more than once. If you want more on this subject, there's a brilliant book titled The Third Chimpanzee by Jared Diamond, which will give you all of the actual reasons for this. I just want you to trust me on it. Even though I do recognize trust me is something that usually used car salesmen say just before they pretend to go to the sales manager and ask if they can sell you that car for a low, low price. But nonetheless, trust me, 
the likelihood of human style intelligence coming uh, happening on its own is vanishingly small. We are not at risk from the spontaneous creation of computer intelligence that is self-motivated to drive us to extinction for no obvious reason. So, have you read about gray goo? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's another one. Of all the things to worry about, here's what will happen if those nanobots escape into the wild and start turning the world into gray goo. Okay, let me tell you something about nature. There's this stuff out there called bacteria and mold and mildew and lichens. The gray goo won't stand a chance. It won't stand a freaking chance. It'll escape into the wild. It'll become bacteria food. We have nothing at risk from gray goo. Here's what we do have at risk. You ever heard of, well, I'm sure you've heard of IBM's Watson. Okay. It didn't just win a Jeopardy, it slaughtered humans at Jeopardy. If that had been a cage match for, uh, what do they call that? Yeah, mixed martial arts. Yeah, yeah it, I like martial arts, I was whatever that thing is where they're like all forms of combat at once that's really popular. It tells you how old I am, I can't come up with the word. But anyway, that stuff. If Watson had been in there, we'd have a bunch of dead humans, right? I mean, it was brutal. It was it was a horrible thing to see. Any of you ever heard of Deep Mind? Okay, tell us about Deep Mind. I'm tired of talking. Uh, so you're referring to Google's yeah. Deep Mind project? Yeah, it's pretty scary. Is it, it though? It, it's uh, probably the best attempt at general intelligence. And, and a computer artificial intelligence. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's, I believe they call it general purpose artificial intelligence as opposed to special purpose. Yeah. What DeepMind does, or at least what they first did to develop it, was they taught it a bunch of old um, Nintendo. Um, Atari games. The, the, was it Atari? Yeah. So, thanks. Yeah, it's fine. That's right, step of my life. Python. <laughs> well, that'll show them. <laughs> it, it, they taught it how to play Atari games. Only the way they taught it to play Atari is they wired it into the game controllers, and they taught it where the score was. And then they gave it a feed to the screen. And that was it. All it had was a view of the sc entire screen, knowledge of what the score was, Connection to the game controllers and the instruction make that number bigger. And all by itself, no matter what game they connected it to, it became the best player ever. By a lot. It would it would learn strategies that humans had never used before. Was, exactly. Was the scariest thing. Yeah, it, so one of my enormous fears is imagine that you take Deep Mind and you make it a CEO. And you say you point to the stock price and you say, make that number bigger. How many companies would have wanted to around until it came up with a good method? Well, lots, but how many, how many CEOs have gone from company to company ruining them only to get a job without a CEO? In fact, when I was an independent consultant, I had, a, I had a, a consulting line that I tried to sell, which was I'll wreck your company for half. Because I figured <laughs> most CEOs come in and make companies worse. I'll do it for 50% of the absurd salary these guys get, what the heck. Okay, so the deal is, it's, it's really not that simple, because a video game is a far more controlled environment. But, the seed is there, the seed is planted, and these things will not become less sophisticated over time, they'll become more sophisticated. There is a Japanese investment firm called Deep Knowledge, they have put an artificial intelligence on the board of directors. And now you're ready for the new metric. It is the HMRI, the Human Machine Relationship Index. And the way the HMRI works is it is an index that goes on a scale of plus two to minus two. Plus two means the humans are completely in charge of the technology. Minus two means the technology is completely in charge of the humans. And from now on, you can start tracking different jobs in the evolution of technology to see who's running the joint. And the sad thing is, humans will be running the joint less and less. Now this started a long time ago. Have you ever worked in a call center? Yeah, you worked in a call center. 
really, who did you report to? The ACD, right? The what? Oh, they didn't even tell you who you reported or what you reported to. I reported to the supervisor. No, you reported to the ACD. The ACD is the thing that told you there's another call waiting for you. Right? Correct. All right. I mean, in, in, in your day-to-day -day world, a machine said, answer the next call. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, we had, we had what was called the auto dialer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you were really reporting the machine. This, this goes back a long way. So it depends on the job. It depends what you're doing. If you're a doctor, IBM is releasing Dr. Watson into the wild. Dr. Watson is the application of the Jeopardy technology to medical diagnosis. So I want you to imagine you're a doctor and you diagnose a patient and Dr. Watson disagrees with you. What do you do? What do you think? Anybody have any ideas? This is not a trick question, this is just a brutally hard question. Better go back and check what you did. And so what's that? I'd say you have to take it, maybe you need to double check and well, see what Dr. Watson maybe missed that you, or yeah. got that you missed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so if, if Watson suggests an additional test you should run so that you end up agreeing with Dr. Dr. Watson, you're fine. What happens if you run all the tests that you can run and Dr. Watson has one diagnosis and you have a different diagnosis. What's the right answer? And by the way, forget lawsuits. Let's just pretend you actually care if your patient lives or dies. <laughs> okay, so you care if your patient lives or dies. Dr. Watson has one diagnosis, you have a different one. Yes, ma'am? You try to decide which one's right, <coughs> using that additional information from Watson. Well, you can ask Watson how Watson arrived at that diagnosis, but at the end, Sometimes, just like human being, you just disagree. You see, you, you, we can always run more tests. Uh, I've been in too many corporations. Here's what we should do as a company to make some money. Well, we should run one more analysis, because what's one more analysis? The answer is you lose six months on your competition. So I'm not letting anybody off the hook out. We can run more tests. We've, run, we've now run all the tests we can. You and Watson disagree. But what do you do as a doctor? Turn off Dr. Watson. <laughs> Turn off Dr. Watson. <laughs> Okay. Ask, and ask Watson if he can hold a scalpel. Yeah. Okay. Ask Watson if he can hold a scalpel. Okay. But they can't. With his robot hands, he can. You have to yeah. make okay. a mistake. You have to learn from your mistake. Okay, so here's what I'm going to put right in front of you. No matter which, what, I'm not going to tell you what you chose, but the answer is the patient dies. Okay. If you decided to trust your own judgment above Dr. Watson's and your patient dies and you have a conscience, okay, so there's three ifs and I know that. Patient <laughs> dies, you trusted your own judgment, what happens? The answer is you kick yourself over and over again, I should have trusted Dr. Watson, right? Okay, what happens if you trust, you say, well, you know, I've been invested a lot in Dr. Watson, has read all the medical literature, knows more than I do, we've run all the tests and Dr. Watson reaches this conclusion, I'll trust Dr. Watson and your patient dies. What would you say to yourself? Death of the machines. Yeah, death of the machines, I should, I should have trusted my judgment. You can't win, right? Mm -hmm. And then, the, you can layer on the malpractice on top of that, but the fact of the matter is, there is no winning this one. So you put Dr. Watson in a medical practice and somebody's gonna have to decide, we, are we gonna trust Dr. Watson or are we gonna trust ourselves? We, us humans. And it's not that there's a right answer, but you're going to still have to arrive at an answer. Now imagine that IBM takes the same technology and instead of applying it to medical diagnosis, it applies it to what we were just talking about, running a company. So Dr. Watson is now going to read all of the management literature to become better at making business decisions than any human CEO. And you know what will happen? It will fry out every circuit board. Because if you ever read all this nonsense, and I've written some of this nonsense, <laughs> no two papers will agree in any possible respect. There's no way of making any sense out of it. Dr. Watson will give up in disgust, go away, and that'll be the end. Divide by zero. Divide by zero. And by the way, this is the end. So thank you for your time and attention. I hope this wasn't a complete waste of it because it's an hour you won't get back anyway. <laughs> yes, sir. What was the uh, ratio that you... The, are you talking about the HMRI? Yeah. Yeah, Human Machine Relationship Index.
If you Google it, you will never find it because the book hasn't come out yet, and we just invented that. For our society as a whole, where do you think we are on that index? Society as a whole? I would say that right now, we are probably about a plus one, which is to say humans mostly in charge, but we are seeing the edge of the slippery slope. And as I say, you look at Watson, you look at DeepMind, you look at, there's already an AI on a, a board of directors someplace, and there's only one way this can go. Unless we decide, because there are really two different paths that we can choose to take. As, be, as an old guy, I call these the PC versus mainframe approach. And it's not the technology. Mainframes, the way you organize the mainframe is you got a big system, you got a bunch of people puffing around it, tending to its care and feeding, bowing down to it as acolytes. The PC is a portal to a universe of possibilities. And it connects to mainframes, it connects to the internet, it connects to um, everything you can imagine, right? We really have two choices here. We can either create a computer-dominated society, which, do you all, have you all heard the definition of a perfect factory? You know that one? Okay, per perfect factory employs one man and one dog. The man is there to feed the dog, the dog's there to keep the man from touching anything. <laughs> <laughs> we're heading, we're heading, and I didn't have to say Python. That was pretty cool. Okay. Um, saw, uh, we're kind of heading. I'm sorry. I think I saw a cartoon recently where it was Watson and a doctor that was playing on that same part, that same uh, saying. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was like a a web comic that was basically they had the dog and he was supposed to not let the doctor touch anything. <laughs> yeah, I think it was KCD. It might have been. I think I, think I remember so. seeing that. Um, so anyway, so we can either go to a computer-dominated <laughs> society where humans remaining roles are to be subordinate to the computer, or we can go in the other direction. Now let's take this back to the EPG, the Meta Technology Generation. We can think instead about computer, sorry, computer enhanced humanity, computer augmented humanity. And I'm not necessarily talking about a cable in the side of your head, but you know, people can now, Google is a new memory. People my age, I actually had this conversation with a guy, he says, First thing that ever happened was the invention of the calculator, because now children don't have to learn the multiplication tables. Who gives a rat's ass? <laughs> I mean, seriously, who cares if you learn multiplication tables? I care if you learn how to think. So, we can either, I mean, these are the two paths we have. Right now, we're still in control, but we need to decide which model we want to follow. And I don't even know how we decide what's going to be. <laughs> Corporations that make the most money following one model, that will take us one way. If corporations make the most money going the other way, we'll follow the other model. And that's what will drive society, is my opinion. Any other questions, discussion? Yes, sir. A couple of years ago, Forbes came out with an interesting article discussing... I doubt that, but... Well, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Basically, the article mentioned that uh, they did a survey and found, uh, back to your employment discussion, that if you jumped employment every seven to four years, mm -hmm. you would on average make like five times as much money as staying in one place. Five times? Yeah, because when you jump employment, you will sometimes get a 10 to 20 percent raise, whereas mm -hmm. uh, it, it, every time you jump, as opposed to a one to two to three percent raise, which of course barely touches inflation. Uh, I didn't have any thoughts on that. Well, first of all, I haven't read the article, but it doesn't surprise me other than I'm surprised it was printed in Forbes. Um, second, <laughs> having lived through this over and over again, there is a general rule of the corporation, which is that nobody inside is allowed to be an expert. It is, by the way, another reason to make your living as a contractor consultant. You see, if you're inside the corporation and you portray yourself as an expert, who the hell do you think you are? I think you're smarter than the rest of us. So socially, you aren't allowed to be an expert, and socially, the company isn't willing to view you as one. And oh, by the way, if they did, they'd have to give you a raise because you're an expert. And theoretically, compensation is based on what you can command in the marketplace. So I'm not the least bit surprised. Um, other than that, I'm not sure. Oh, it, it, the flip side of this is, 
if you need more expertise, rather than train your people, it's easier to hire somebody from the outside you think has it, even if, see, because companies forget, you don't actually hire the resume. You only think you're hiring the resume. All of you, if you're looking for employment as opposed to contract work, and actually even contract work, remember this, your resume is a brochure. Forget that you're looking for work. You are a product. The resume is the brochure for the product called you. Always phrase everything in the resume to make that product look as good as possible because the way it works inside corporations is you have, <laughs> you have recruiters who are so damn lazy and they use computer programs to look for keywords and if you're smart enough to know what keywords are looking for and put them on the resume, then you pass the first screen. It's a, it's a system, if they hadn't already used Dumb and Dumber for the movie, it applied perfectly to this system. I don't know if I answered your question or some other question no, I wanted to answer, but what the hell. <laughs> Any other questions, discussion, arguments? Yes, sir. So where does accountability come into all of this? What? Because, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're never going to put the computer up on the dirt, up on the witness stand and call for his head. Well, okay. That's even better. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, what was the last corporate executive who got called on the witness stand? There was a guy, who's the guy that owned the coal mines? Blankenship? He said, you know, those the paying the fines for violating the safety regulations were just the cost of doing business. I don't think he's been charged with a felony yet. So, actually, so where's accountability? There's a saying that we, that we consultants use, which is, that's a great question. And that's a great question, as consultants speak for, I don't have a great answer. I don't know that there is going to be any is going about accountability because, see, the thing is a corporation isn't really a person. Citizens United notwithstanding, corporations aren't really people too. They're a different kind of organism that operates under different rules and different premises. We've tended to forget that in the legal system. So it's very difficult to establish accountability for corporate malfeasance or misdeeds. The board of directors will still get sued by bottom feeding shareholders who just aren't happy that the stock didn't rise. But for uh, 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 violation of regulations, criminal activity, this can be challenging. And by the way, an artificial intelligence is more likely to deliberately violate the law if that's the net pro most profitable action. Yeah. So I don't know what the answer there is, but I don't think it's going to be very pretty. Yes, sir. Well, I mean, I guess the reason a lot of people incorporate anyways is that the you know, instead of them taking the liability, it's on the corporation. Yeah, so right. Really, you could say in that situation, it would be the piece, like it wouldn't be the whatever intelligence is doing yeah. it. It still falls back on the corporation, which could wipe it out. You know, right. Now, the, the original premise was limited to financial liability, but you're right. It is, it is been sort of expanded to cover more forms of liability, <laughs> and so accountability is tough even without putting the machine in charge. I don't see machines in charge improving that at all. Quite the opposite. It'll just make it harder, which is, I think, th that was really a Jeopardy question, wasn't it? <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. Artificial intelligence would have to inherently be a sociopath. It depends on how you program it. Uh, I'm old enough to remember program, I, yeah. How would you program consciousness, though? Well, it's not the matter of consciousness. Uh, you remember Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics? Okay, uh, now I really feel old. <laughs> Isaac Asimov is one of the great science fiction writers who wrote a lot about robots. He came up with three laws of robotics to keep society safe from robots. And if I remember, the first law was no, ro no robot can ever allow a human to come to harm. The second one is it's, um, oh, I forget the second. Obey all commands from the uh, I think it's allowed, it's, it's allowed self-preservation if it doesn't oh, yeah, yeah. interfere with the first law. Third and allow no human to come to allow no human to come to harm first. Yeah. And the second one I think has a, is a combination of the least number of humans that come to harm or something. It's a, it's actually an incredible hierarchy and there's been books written around it and it almost always works. Okay, yeah, it started at three. Okay. Oh, oh, wait, wait, hold on. Is proof that Google is in fact the new memory? <laughs> A rob uh, via Wikipedia, a robot may not injure a human being or through an action come allow a human being to come to harm. <coughs> Two, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. 
And three, a robot must protect its own existence so as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. Thank you very much. Speaking of robots, by the way, the next session you want to hear this young lady speak along with um, Amy Platt. We're going to be talking Flat. about... Hmm? Flat. Flat. I was close. Assuming over one lousy letter. Okay. <laughs> They're going to be talking about robots in the school system and how they're going to change the world, I think, one battle bot at a time. That's in track two. So anyway, um, it is, I think, possible to program computers so as to do what's best for human beings. I just, that's not the same as pointing at that score in the Dow Jones and saying, make this number get bigger. Anybody else? Well, listen, thanks again, and I only have one more thing to say to you, Python. <laughs>